This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Great. Uh, thank you, Rachel. So I'm aiming for about 12 minutes here. Um, so by way of introduction, these comments, and it can only be comments because it's a very short time, uh, draw on a larger paper on the visual capitalist and technological project of mapping infrastructural lines in the British Empire circa 1900. So I'm interested in this whole idea of making lines physically um, as a way of reconsidering our own methods uh, in world history and global history writing today, where I think there's again an interest in plotting lines, networks across regions and territories. So just to sort of give a sort of introduction to why I got into this, I guess there were sort of two different impulses um, for this research. On the one hand, I took um, students um, over a period of years uh, into uh, the RCS collections, which Rachel have, has just introduced, because they're, they're actually just very close to where I teach uh, in the history faculty in Cambridge. And like the students, I found uh, the sources of the RCS rather alluring. Alluring because there's lots of wonderful ephemera um, of the kind one can't get hold of uh, in uh, the official colonial archives. And for the students and for me, I guess, there was a sense in which they allowed a way of imagining and perhaps even, and I use this word for a reason, recreating uh, the imperial experience. So that was one reason and one impulse. The second was that last summer I, I, couldn't, I, I was not able to travel overseas for research and I had to do a paper um, through easily accessible uh, sources, and I just asked myself, well, can I really write a global history paper uh, from my doorstep in Cambridge? Um, so the reason I kind of state it like that is because as I started doing this research for this paper, I realized that it was actually quite easy to write uh, a global history paper from Cambridge, and that ease, in turn, uh, became rather disturbing. Um, I realized that in order to engage critically with easily available sources, it was important to put them into the context of less exciting and sometimes more difficult ones and to tease apart their gaps. So that's where the paper's gonna end. So it all began, I guess, with this album, which is Colombo Harbor Completed, 1885, uh, which I should, uh, I should just say that the RCS collection has a lot of artifacts like this because it seems like technical officers of the British Empire were members of this club. Now, the reason why I was particularly interested in this album from 1885 is because of images like this. The album has the subject of a line. And the line here is the breakwater, as it lies in water, often in an unpeopled vista. The whole album, I guess, is about the way a line cuts across the division between sea and land linking steamships as they arrive at one of the busiest ports of the British Empire with a network of railroads uh, and roads which transport commodities and peoples to labor in the high British colony. So it's about the placement of one line in the context of a further set of lines and networks. So it's very easy to romanticize the line and to be drawn in by this album, to kind of get carried away as you sort of trace the line into the horizon. Um, and um, this is particularly evident uh, in these two images here, this one, Breakwater from Titan Root, uh, March, uh, March 1885. But I guess a more critical engagement with the Breakwater is called for by this image, which is also in uh, the Coud album. Because the way I interpret this image in the paper is that on the one hand, what it does is that it makes the breakwater a subject, um, but on the one hand, what it does is that it displaces the city of Colombo, which you can sort of see in the horizon there, and this is a period when Colombo is really booming and expanding. So the breakwater becomes the subject, and Colombo is displaced on the one hand, and on the other hand, also, you've got to look very, very closely to see all the people on the breakwater here. Most of the images in this album don't have people, and this is one of them that does, and these are the convicts who labored on the breakwater, and they're standing to attention and still getting sort of blurred and sort of, um, uh, sort of becoming part of the breakwater in turn. So I contend that this album is a powerful sort of artifact of the globalization of high British imperialism. Colombo Port was nicknamed the Clapham Junction of the East between 1880 and 1914. By tonnage, it was the seventh most busy port in the world 
in 1910. And that's because of something we just heard a minute ago, because it's on the route to Australia, because it's a point of connection to the Indian subcontinent, because Ceylon in turn becomes a node uh, of the plantation um, uh, economy, the lots of sort of crops, uh, commodities going down uh, out from the port uh, of Colombo. So it's easy to track the history of globalization through the RCS album itself. And here the man, uh, Sir John Coode, uh, is quite interesting. He's one of uh, the most distinguished harbor engineers of this period. He advises on harbor designs for many different colonies, ranging from St. Lucia and Trinidad to Sierra Leone, Port Adelaide and Penang. So I guess the story of this particular breakwater in Colombo can stand for the story of globalization more broadly, a story that repeats itself across the British Empire. And we have um, a W.C. Sargent here being given this uh, album by John Cood, uh, and Sargent is the crown agent to the colony. So it's almost like the harbor engineer here presents the album, it's annotated, this copy in the RCS, to uh, the, the, the official powers of colonialism. In the album itself, it's a sort of photo diary. You go from the arrival of the Prince of Wales, uh, laying the first stone for the breakwater, and then you end with the breakwater completed. So it's really a kind of indicator of the colonial elite, one could argue. But there, in a sense, it's important to pause. Um, and I need to make something of a confession here, and sort of do this in some trepidation uh, in, in the gathering of archivists, but I wanted to sort of work on the reception history of this album. And I went into the RCS collections, and I got out all the wonderful postcards which you have, but they were all blank. And I just thought, well, I can't really do the reception history of the coup images and images like this of the breakwater through the RCS collections. And I just so happened, I didn't do this because I knew I had to, I just so happened to look online and discovered on eBay a whole set of images of the coup breakwater from the very period uh, that this album uh, uh, arises from. Uh, circa 1900, which could be bought at four pounds a piece. Now, I'll just raise that for you to sort of discuss later. Um, so um, I restricted myself to one night, but I managed to buy 40, actually, in one night uh, at four pounds a piece. Now, what emerged from these, I, I did check with Peter Mandler later, actually, and said it was totally fine <laughs> that people do this, <laughs> remember. Um, anyway, so I was a bit worried about doing it in the first place. Um, so what we're, what's happening in this period is that there's a dramatic increase uh, in the number of postcards um, passing through places like Colombo. Um, and the, the more I looked at these postcards, uh, the more I realized that actually often it w didn't matter what was on the back of it. It didn't matter what the picture was because you sent the postcard from wherever you were in the Indian Ocean. So you sent a postcard to Colombo from Penang, sent a, sent a post postcard to Colombo from the Suez Canal, etc., etc. But with the breakwater, this is a small sample and one would need to do much more research. With the breakwater, it was different. One did comment on the breakwater. And the reason for that is that there were lots of tourists passing through Colombo um, and lots of people in transit through Colombo just for a few hours in this period. And that's, in a sense, the origins of being in transit uh, in the early 20th century with high imperialism. And so with the breakwater, one gets comments on the breakwater. So here we have, I'm do the time. anyway, um, uh, here we have one posted uh, on the 18th of August, 1910, uh, to Mrs. Kennedy of 36 Fleming Street, Mayport, Cumberland, England. This breakwater is a fine site. We're laying alongside it. This one, uh, again from 1910, a very similar image. And actually, this is very similar to the iconography of one of the images in the Cood album. They say this is one of the sites of Colombo in the, in the rainy and windy season. So buying postcards online induced some anxiety in me about the market for these objects, and in turn made me wonder about how the visual image of the port of Colombo in its own time as well was a product of the market. So in the longer paper, I tease apart the importance of merchant houses in Colombo to the building of this port using the colonial office papers at Kew. Um, in summary, sort of working with the colonial office papers at Kew, I started to realize a number of gaps uh, which one could track in these images. And let me just quickly summarize some of the things that I came across uh, in placing this sort of visual archive at the RCS online in relation to perhaps more <laughs> sort of boring sort of textual sources uh, and colonial reports. 
On the first, on the one, on on um, the first sort of point, uh, which uh, was quite striking, was that actually there's a whole set of people who don't appear in these images, and this is a sort of map from the BL uh, of the breakwater. Later, another one was built up there, but right at the tip there, it's annotated landing jetty. And what happens at the landing jetty is, according to the port surgeon, whose reports are a queue, Indian indentured laborers arrive. But as soon as they arrive at the breakwater, they're sort of taken away. Uh, and they don't really uh, emerge very much in these images. You get lots of images of indent indentured laborers at the plantations working, especially women, images which are very sexualized of tea, tea pluckers uh, at the plantations. But in fact, uh, of Indian indentured laborers arriving, there are very few images, uh, uh, no images that are, f are found. Um, and uh, it's also tied to the fact that these Indian indentured laborers arrived at certain times. Uh, between 9 and 10 a.m., allowing the port to be inhabited by different vessels during a single day. What happened was as this port was developed, uh, a further bout of uh, infrastructural development, uh, circa 1900, after the 1885 moment, um, a lot of the native vessels, quote unquote, are actually taken out of the port and put into a fishery harbor uh, further north. And so there's a sort of visual spatial evacuation of native vessels from the port of Colombo as well. So let me make some tentative conclusions before handing over to Rachel. Global history is an exciting project and the resources for it become more and more available online and within and within reach of our collections in the UK. And I wish simply to raise a point of observation. Globalizing narratives may be too easy to tell and the visual life of globalization, its networks and circuits, still has the power to mesmerize the historian and curator, and these images still live in the contemporary context of the market. Writing and curating global histories should thus also come with a critique of its limits and the importance of placing our own collections within material from elsewhere, other genres of sources and places of collection, as it were, and also with the consideration of the effects of globalization on the subjects of the empire. Many of us have been trained in reading against the grain of the colonial archive. Perhaps it's time too uh, to see the ephemera of colonialism in negative so that we can um, uh, understand the powerful visual, visual afterlife of imperial metaphors, lines and networks in global history today. So in a sense, the point is to think critically about the origins of some of the language that we use uh, in global history. Rachel.